Hello, my name is William and I am the developer of PiffLab and today is going to be epic because I will be presenting an introduction to some of the PIV equipment that I designed here at Opolution. I will show you some lasers and cameras, talk about laser color synchronization and frame straddling <clears throat> and also show you a PIV experiment at the very end. But first of all, I have to celebrate something. At the end of the year 2022, PivLab has become the most cited uh, PIV software actually worldwide. I already posted uh, some data in my blog a while ago and also what search strings I used. But uh, now PivLab has outpaced the second place software um, from LaVision, which is called Davis. Um, and I believe Davis is not really comparable to PivLab probably because it's much more complete and can do all sorts of crazy flow related analysis that I probably don't even understand. But maybe this is also one of the reasons why PivLab has become so popular because it is really simple. Still, it is relatively powerful. And how do German people celebrate? Well, of course, it will involve some beer. Cheers. In the year 2021, I designed my own synchronizer because at that time we were trying to make the setup of our measurement services more compact and also more easy to transport and set up. Then I designed also a laser driver circuit uh, and used that uh, with the, some high power laser diodes for some lab tests and later on also for some time resolved uh, PIV service measurements. At Optolution, we then uh, decided to sell these devices because together with PivLab, they make up a really nice and easy PIV tool. And as you can see in this image, uh, PivLab supports a number of cameras and lasers or even LEDs, and they can all be controlled directly from PivLab. Our lasers and synchronizers are assembled directly by us. This, for example, is the PCBA of our 5 watts laser. It is built into the device that you see here, a very compact and powerful PIV illumination system with the built-in synchronizer and sheet optics. Yeah, I would like to briefly explain how the system works and what components it is made of. So we start uh, with a computer that is running MATLAB and inside the MATLAB environment, the graphical interface of PIFLAB is running. PIFLAB communicates with a USB stick that actually is just a wireless serial link. So this has two advantages from my point of view. A, you don't have any cables between computer and most of your PIV equipment. And B, um, the wireless link can communicate with as many devices as you want. So Optolution, for example, also has seating generators and lens control system. And that can be simply added without adding additional cables or some interfaces or whatever. This USB stick or dongle communicates with the LDPS5 module that I just showed you, this grayish box. And it transfers information like frame rate, laser power, pulse length, etc. The synchronizer inside the module then sends signals to the laser driver circuit, which is a very fast and also specialized laser driver chip. And the laser driver then toggles the laser diode on and off, which is uh, coupled, the laser diode is then coupled with some optics that generate a laser sheet. The synchronizer also sends the trigger signals to a supported camera. That's why, it call, why it's called synchronizer, of course, because it synchronizes stuff. And every camera um, needs slightly different uh, trigger signals. So the laser module has a specific firmware for the connected camera. And this camera then films the particles in the laser sheet and transfers the images to PIVLAB in real time. Our laser modules can also be used with other synchronizers if we put a different firmware on them. But then you can't use PIVLAB anymore um, to control your experiment, obviously. We also have uh, even more powerful lasers like the 20 and 40 watts pulse lasers. And these really make a lot of light um, and they allow you to measure larger areas or higher flow velocities. You can also measure um, or do PIV studies in air with them. And then there are also compact cameras that work nicely for many PIV applications and they uh, sometimes also have automatic lens control for enabling an autofocus functionality directly from PIVLAB. And in uh, this video you see how the autofocus works. This time I'm not focusing on a particle pattern but just on some image. But later on in the experiment I will also show you how it looks if you focus on a laser sheet. Okay, as you know, PivLab is free and open source and it will always stay like this and I will never reduce uh, the amount of features in PivLab or stop releasing updates. Well, obviously, if I, if I die, then 
this will happen, but I hope <coughs> it still takes some time. And the commercial part um, or image acquisition module is just an add-on to the free part of PIVLAB. The source code of this uh, add-on uh, is also open and free, but without buying a laser or a synchronizer from, Opt uh, from Optolution, you will actually not have any advantage uh, from these features, but they also don't harm you. Um, yeah, now I would like to talk about laser color because I sometimes get the question why our lasers emit blue light instead of the classical green light uh, that you see often in many PIV studies. And the reason is simply that it seems much easier for the industry to make high power um, laser darts with blue color than with green or red color. And interestingly, the human eye is much less sensitive to blue light than to green light, but for many monochrome PIV cameras, the light color doesn't really matter. They are similarly sensitive to blue, green and red colors. But high power green laser diodes are much more expensive and also more difficult to make uh, because you have to align multiple laser diodes to get enough power. And I personally also haven't seen a green uh, 40 watts laser yet. I've seen some blue ones, the ones the one from us, for example, but not a green uh, colored laser diode that is affordable. Well, I ha also have to note that there are some cameras that are less sensitive to blue light, maybe something like 30% less sensitive, but still also in this case, using blue light for the illumination of particles makes more sense because of cost and the available power that you actually get. Now, as you know, particle image velocimetry very often uses uh, double cavity Q-switched NDIAC lasers for the illumination and these are certainly a very good choice well if you obviously have the money to buy it um, but there's one uh, very important difference between these Q-switch lasers and pulse laser diodes however um, because Q-switch lasers have pulse length that are yeah around 10 nanoseconds or so and they concentrate a lot of energy into such a short pulse by using an optical resonator and stuff like that all the details are of course available somewhere in the internet just google for q switches then um, you can look it up if you don't know it already and um, this is of course absolutely perfect for pav but often these lasers are limited to a relatively low double pulse repetition rate so this means that the velocity fields that you capture that you capture are acquired with a, a rate of about 15 hertz or so. That's a typical rate. Laser diodes, on the other hand, are toggled on and off by some driver electronics. That means that a single pulse doesn't have a higher peak power than when the laser is turned on continuously. So this means if you need a lot of light, then your pulses need to be longer, right? And that leads uh, obviously to motion blur. Yeah, motion blur has been analyzed in a few studies already and I also analyzed the effect directly in PIVLAB and with our laser diodes with a little um, setup and the results were presented on a German conference. The paper is available as open access and if this is interesting for you then please check it out. I uh, hope I um, will not forget to put the link down in the description but of course I can already uh, tell you the my main findings which are that uh, excessive motion blur has a negative effect on measurement uncertainty. Well, this is not really a surprise, I hope, for you. Um, but if you look at this image, um, these are the real images that I tested and um, that I also acquired with the laser diodes, um, then you see that this is really extreme motion blur, which actually no one would use in a real experiment. Um, so this means that if you keep the motion blur relatively low, for example, below five pixels of length, then the displacement error increases only very little, about 0.01 pixels. And this is 10 times lower than the commonly accepted accuracy limit of PIV, which is about 0.1 pixels. But you also have to keep in mind that limiting motion blur with pulsed lasers uh, will result in less uh, light on the camera chip. And the lower particle brightness actually has much more negative effect uh, than motion blur, mainly because uh, the lowered signal to noise ratio that you have if you have uh, less light intensity on the particles. But yeah, not only the motion uh, blur should be limited, but also the delta T between the PIV images within uh, a double image. This is something that you probably know, but I also want to explain this a little bit um, so we understand how our synchronizer works and how frame straddling etc works um, because if you would have a very large delta t and then during cross correlation there will be too many lost particle pairs in the two images um, 
which will reduce the strength of the correlation and also lower the signal to noise ratio. And this can clearly be seen in these correlation matrices that you see here, where the displacement increases from uh, left to right. Um, and at a certain level of displacement, the particle pair loss is just too high and it becomes difficult to identify the displacement peak anymore, which is the main indicator for doing displacement measurements in PIV, as you probably know. And there's one pretty crude rule of thumb and that says that the displacement should be about limited to about 25% of the interrogation window. And in this case, we have to say 25% of the initial interrogation window because later on we shift the windows and then this doesn't play such a uh, large role anymore. Because if the displacement is higher, then the correlation will uh, be worse due to a loss of particle pair. So um, as an example, let's assume 10 pixels as the maximum displacement that we can accept for our um, PIV analysis. So in order to measure high flow velocities, the time from one image to the next, which is called the interframe time, and also the particle illumination time, they must both uh, be small. And this can only be achieved by pulsing the lasers and synchronizing the pulses with the camera unless you have a super high speed camera, which is not affordable to most people. Yeah, now I would like to show you actually a comparison between a constant wave uh, laser illumination and a pulse laser illumination. So um, let's just have a look at the, at the most simple and low cost PIV setup that uses a high power laser pointer and continuous illumination. So in this graph on the X axis is the time. Then the laser light is switched on and it stays on all the time, of course, because it's continuous illumination. The camera is running at 100 Hertz. So that means that every 10 milliseconds it acquires an image. Then the exposure must be reduced to about one millisecond to reduce the amount of motion blur at faster flows. And this will then in the end result in a double image rate or PIV data rate of 50 Hertz. Now, in this case, we assume that we always correlate image A and B and then C and D, because this makes the story that I want to tell now much uh, more easier to understand. Yeah, now I would like to explain what maximum velocities you can measure with this kind of setup. So let's take, as I already mentioned, 10 pixels as the maximum acceptable displacement from one image to the next. And our field of view or our measurement region is, let's assume, 100 times 100 millimeters and the camera has 100 hertz or 100 frames per second with a resolution of 2000 times 2000 pixels. Now the maximum velocity that we can measure can be approximated with a very simple equation, uh, which is uh, the field of view divided by the resolution times the maximum acceptable displacement, 10 pixels, and then divided by the interframe time, which is, as I just said, 10 milliseconds in a 100 frames per second camera. No, I didn't say this, but now I say it. The maximum velocity that we get out of this is 0.05 meters per second, which is actually not so much. But now if we take the same setup, but if we pulse the laser and synchronize it with the camera, then uh, this allows us to put one of the light pulses of the laser pulses at the very end of the uh, camera exposure and the second light pulse at the very beginning of the next exposure. And this is called frame straddling and it is used, it's a technique that is used very often in PIV setups. And now again, let's check the maximum velocities that are possible with this uh, sort of enhanced setup. The parameters are all the same except for the interframe time, which can now be 10 times lower, resulting in a 10, 10 times higher velocity that we can measure. But this velocity is only the limit if you want to have the same illumination time as in the first example, um, which was, I think, uh, one millisecond or so, which is a very long illumination time. Um, because we are pulsing the laser anyway, then we can also reduce the pulse length and putting the, this allows us to put the two light pulses uh, even closer together. And in this way, you'll be able to capture flows with easily five meters per second or even 50 meters per second with uh, such a relatively low cost and very compact setup. And at least I think that this is really cool. So the take home message of this part is that pulse lasers and synchronizer are pretty awesome because frame straddling enables you to use much shorter interval times and also to measure much higher flow velocities. And this is what at least I 
want to do with PIV. And if you want to play with the settings, the frame straddling and different cameras yourself, then the latest release of PIVLAB allows you to choose one of the configurations and play with the timing settings, even if you don't own the hardware, but hopefully soon you will own the hardware. Um, and then you can see a graphical representation of the whole timing, explaining where the pulses are located and what double frame repetition rate you get with what kind of camera and so on. Uh, okay, now this was the theoretical part of uh, this video. I hope you're still listening. Um, and now I would like to show you how easy it actually is to get the Optolution PIV system for Piffler up and running. First, you put the camera and laser onto a tripod. You plug in one end of the synchronization cable into the camera and the other end into the laser. Then you connect the USB cable with the camera and obviously also with the computer on the other side. And then you need to connect the safety interlock with a door switch, for example, and the contact of this interlock needs to be close to unlock the laser. Then next step is to connect the power supply and to switch the laser on, of course. And then finally, you plug in the USB wireless serial link and start PIVLAB. In PIVLAB, um, then you go to the image acquisition module. <coughs> you um, select a project folder where you want to save your images and also save your session. Then um, you have to select the suitable configuration. So in this case, I have the 5 watts laser and the Optocan. It is yeah, detected automatically. Then I am changing the camera bit depth to 12 bits in this experiment. I am setting the frame rate to 80 hertz and then just toggling on the laser and starting the live image preview, which is running without synchronizer at this moment, but I just want to use the autofocus. So I'm selecting the correct lens, then hitting the autofocus, and then the autofocus starts to focus on the particle pattern that is illuminated by the laser. After that, you switch off laser and the camera again. And now we can select the pulse distance or interframe time that we want. I have found out that 1500 microseconds is a good choice for this uh, experiment. We want to save the images and we want to capture 500 double images <coughs> in this experiment. Yeah, and then I start the uh, capturing. It asks again for safety reasons if I want to start the laser and also if I want to overwrite existing files. And then, yeah, I'm just uh, trying to do some nice vortex rings. After the images are transferred, you can scroll through the um, double image pairs and you can quickly do some analysis to check if you have some nice, nice data, which is the case here, I think. Pretty nice vortex rings that are generated. And after that, um, you can do the analysis, of course, uh, for all the images in this um, session, and then you can export everything. And this is how it looks like. So pretty nice vortex rings um, acquired with a relatively high temporal resolution of 80 double frames per second, so 160 frames per second. This camera can also run much faster, up to 400 frames per second. Yeah, well, this experiment that I just uh, set up here has pretty low requirements on laser and camera because it's small velocities, it's a small um, field of view. Um, but this is just what I have here at hand now. Um, as I already told you, with the 40 watts module, you can easily do measurements in air, also at higher velocities. Um, yeah, but this is just to show you how simple this setup actually is. Okay, now this is the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe see you next time. Bye-bye.